you. Okay, so, so first of all, I want to recall what we got yesterday about existence of a, of a flow for starting from a regular initial network. And uh, if we start with a regular initial network, so only triple junction, only 120 degrees, being too compatible. So at every triple junction, there is this condition that uh, is crucial in the theorem, uh, in the theory of Solonikov in order to find out a solution for small time. This two compatibility condition was this one at the time zero, the initial network, which actually implies the sum of the free curvature is zero and vice versa. If you have a network with sum of free curvature equal to zero, you can call it a geometric to, compatib to compatible. You can reparameterize it in order that it becomes, uh, it, it goes to satisfy this one. So if you have this one, you have, uh, this is for a trio, then this is for the general network, you have an evolution for a short time. The evolution is immediately smooth actually. And smooth uh, means uh, that uh, not only it's infinity, but also that all the compatibility conditions, geometric or not, are satisfied at every positive time. So if you have only geometric compatibility, you reparameterize, you restart your flow. And uh, by approximation, you can also get that if you start, uh, so this is the geometric compatible, so you get a flow also in this case. In this case, the curvature is continuous up to time zero. Instead, in this case, when uh, you want to evolve uh, only C2 without compatibility condition initial guy, well, you can get a flow by approximation, but the curvature is no more continuous up to time zero, and actually you only have C1 continuity up to time zero. So the tangent go to the tangents. So you have at least the uh, continuity of, for instance, of the 120 degrees condition, so you have, but not C2 continuity, because uh, the compatibility condition are satisfied immediately for every positive time. So if it is continuity, there should be satisfied also at time zero, and this is possibly not true. Moreover, since you really want to evolve, as I wrote yesterday, also non-regular networks, in that case, you have to use this theorem here that I think, uh, I think you know some about bra bracket flows by the lecture the previous week, I guess, most of you. And here, you even lose the C1 continuity at time zero. So you have a bracket flow which is immediately smooth. Immediately all the condition, all the compatibility condition at the triple junction are satisfied. It's a, a, most, a regular net, the, the evolving networks are immediately regular. So all the triple junction, all and the 120 degrees condition satisfied. But you only have kind of, if, of uh, measure theoretic continuity in the tangent at a time zero and positive time, which is the measure the theoretic continuity given by being a bracket flow. Anyway, all these flows for every positive time are smooth. So if we forget the starting time, immediately we are smooth. We are in a smooth flow, and so you have uh, all the compatibility condition, and you have a sati satisfy something like gamma t is equal to curvature times the normal plus some tangential component times the tangent vector. And moreover, we have this flow starting from zero t. So if we move a little bit uh, and we look at this flow on an interval epsilon t with positive epsilon, well, this is a fully smooth flow, for instance, look also this. And actually, there is always a possibility to reparameterize flow like this in order that it's a special flow, which means that uh, it satisfies x squared, which is, was the ingredient to produce a curvature flow starting using the, the Solonikov theory. 
But this is quite good because uh, if I only write this, this function lambda, it's uh, unknown and actually can be varied because as we said, reparameterization modify only the tangential velocity of your flow. So there is geometric uniqueness of this flow in the right class, but geometric means that you can vary in the interior of the curves, the tangential velocity, and you don't see anything if you only look at the whole shape of your network. So if I choose the right, a right reparameterization, not till time zero, but from some positive time on, I can always assume that my flow is a special flow, so it's given by this, which means that I have an expression for lambda now, which is useful. Lambda is actually the tangential part of this guy, so it's exactly And tau is clearly given by so this becomes the third, which is actually equal to minus uh, one over. So I have an expression for lambda, so I can use it to, um, to get evolution equation not only on the curvature and its derivatives like I did yesterday, but also on lambda by means of the evolution equation. And uh, which is actually what I'm going to try to see today because uh, for the analysis of singularity, you need to estimate. Estimates on curvature, all the quantities around. So you have to write down how to get estimate. Usually you take the evolution, write down the evolution equation for the relevant quantities, try to estimate in some way. Classically, for smooth uh, hypersurfaces, you do by being on maximum principle. That's the usual uh, most important tool in getting estimate, point wise estimate. In this case, we have uh, boundary points around. So maximum principle doesn't work very well if you don't know that the maximum of the quantity you want to estimate stays inside. So if you are not able to, to, to conclude that the maximum of your quantity is in the inside, is on the boundary, you cannot use maximum principle. So you cannot use the same line. So actually one possibility is to use integral estimates. With integral estimates things get better because uh, the triple junction in a way, if the quantities you are interested are good, which good means uh, several things, then uh, they are not so much boundary points because uh, you will do integration by parts, you have boundary contribution, but because of the condition of 120 degrees, in several situations, this boundary contribution will cancel each other and they don't give any contribution. So in a way, from a distributional point of view, and if you're looking for integral estimates, in several situations, these are not boundary points, are inner points of your network. So when I will speak of boundary points, I will really have in mind the fixed end points on the network on the boundary of the domain. So now, today I will show you some, uh, how to get some of these estimates. And uh, let me only say another couple of things. What can be done by means of maximum principle is actually that these, uh, all these uh, smooth flows that are really re parameterized in this way, and now I will consider only these special flows here, are always embedded. A network cannot lose its embeddedness during, uh, till it doesn't get singular. So things like uh, this, that these two curves get to touch each, each other cannot happen, it's always embedded, and even more, they cannot go to cross each other. This is because if you put yourself here, you can use an argument by maximum principle, which is standard in mean curvature flow. There are, if you look at things here, you only deal with, mean, with curvature flow curves. There are no triple junction, forget triple junction. And so with the same argument that a curve, an embedded, initially embedded curve cannot go to lose its embeddedness, at the same way, a network, here, for still the evolution is smooth, 
cannot lose the embeddedness. So all these flows are flows of embedded networks, smooth with all the compatibility condition and spatial like this. And another thing that I had just say very fast yesterday is that uh, there is uh, really no hope for uniqueness and uh, an easy example to say this, uh, suppose that you start with a guy like this in a square and now this guy gets exactly in the situation that you can use the theorem on Milman and never should say there's what, that, uh, okay, so there is a bracket flow here starting from this guy, immediately uh, regular, so it opens, so this four point, you expect that it opens, it is <coughs> like two triple junction getting far each other. So for instance, you can expect that this can happen, something like this, with 120, 120, 20. and then it moves on. But actually, because of the symmetry of the problem, so it's uh, the, the, uh, our initial network is symmetric by rotation of 90 degrees, you can always admit that if there is this solution, and this there, well, you also have the other solution, rotating this in the other direction. And there is no way to decide what is the best so actually there is a really uh, loss of uniqueness in this problem so what we can hope we cannot hope for uniqueness but conjecturally I think it's a conjecture of Tom Manen for the generic not so symmetric like in this situation initial data you should be uniqueness of the flow, but this is only a conjecture and uh, what does it mean generic must be clarified actually. So it's only a little bit of speculation about this. Okay, so after we start, we start with uh, these smooth flows. So we know that for some time you have a smooth uh, regular evolution and then you want to understand what happens at some time. Possibly nothing happens. Possibly your network goes on for every time. And hopefully you expect uh, the case, the maximal time of smooth existence. You expect if this maximal time is plus infinity that your network will converge since we are moving by the gradient of the total length to a critical point of the connection, network connecting the points on the boundary of your domain. What is something sometimes called a Steiner a Steiner uh, network, which should be a critical point. So this could happen if uh, you have a smooth flow without any kind of singularities for every positive time. Unfortunately, it's possible to show that there are examples when this T is not plus infinity. I'll show you an example in a while. So at some point, this, so at some point there sh something happens, you have the maximal time which is finite, uh, and uh, some singularity during your flow may, can appear. And in the simulation that we saw yesterday, actually singularities are apparently related to a change of structure. The more or less the, the goal of today and tomorrow that uh, singularities are change of structure. No change of structure, no singularities. Okay, the first theorem, the usual theorem zero in geometric flows is usually at a singular time in the smooth situation, curvature must blow up. It happens in mean curvature flow, it happens in Ricci flow. If your curvature is bounded, you, there is no singularity. But here we have to admit that uh, possibly there is also a different singularity where maybe the curvature is behaving well, but the length of, of a curve or, or a region uh, are going to, are, or a region is vanishing or a length of one curve is going to zero so the curve is vanished. So the first theorem that I want to show today, at 
least in a sketch of the proof, is that if we have uh, the maximal time is finite, actually one of the two conditions, one of the two things happens, or the, cur or the curvature, either the curvature is not bounded, at t goes to big T, or the length, or at least one curve of the evolving network, as t is the, our flow, our smooth flow of networks, is going to zero when t goes to big T. Actually, these two conditions are not mutually exclusive. You, you can have one, the first, the second, or both together. And uh, actually, what I will, uh, this is, the, as I said, the basis theorem that tells you what's happening at a singular time. And actually, what I'm going to do tomorrow to refine this theory in saying that one must always happen. So at every singular time, there must be associated some change of structure. Some curve is going to zero, curve or region. Because if a region goes to zero, one curve at least is going to zero. So this is a ground level, and tomorrow we'll try to refine it, uh, saying that uh, first must happen always. Then we will divide two cases. If first is happening, and uh, you can have two happening also, so curvature unbounded or curvature bounded, and the analysis of the two cases. And we will see that in the, the case when one and two are both, both happens, it's exactly the case when a region is vanishing. And when one happens and two not, two instead the curvature stays bounded, it's exactly the case when only one curve is going to zero. So there is a, a full description at a singular, at a singular time. Okay, now, I'm sorry, today will be a little bit boring because uh, in order to, to do this, usually what you do in the smooth case, well, you take the curvature, you write down the evolution equation, you write down the evolution equation for the derivatives of the curvature, time and space derivative of the curvature, and then you try to prove that if your curvature is uniformly bounded, so you negate condition two, all the derivatives of the curvature are uniformly bounded during the flow, then all the derivatives of your map gamma are bounded during the flow, then you can get a limit by Ascoli Arzela. So you get a limit uh, network when t goes to big T. This limit is uh, smooth because you have bounds on all the derivatives. So you can reapply the previous starting theorems and so contradicting the fact that t is the maximum time of a smooth existence of one flow. This is the line when there are no triple junction around. And uh, the tool is maximum principle. In presence of triple junction, well, you also can have this uh, fact that one length can go to zero, and maximum principle cannot be used. So the line is the same, but you have to use different tools in order to get the same result. So we start with the, with the working on evolution equation in order to get estimates. So we have uh, this guy here from now on. And necessary. The first, uh, <coughs> the first uh, computation I want to do is to compute the evolution of a length of a single curve. Let's call it Li. So we have uh, our network here. Let's take this. This is one curve of the network. And Li is simply the length of that curve. So actually, it's given by the integral over gamma i of one time the measure given by the arc length parameter. And actually here, if you want to, if you, we want to compute this derivative, this is gamma i t. Actually, well, the point is to 
compute the evolution of the measure associated to the arc length. Here again, using the formulas that I showed you yesterday, is since the arc length measure is given by this guy here, well, now you simply have to take the time derivative of this guy, which means the time derivative of this guy. This guy is not affected by time, but this guy, yes. So if you do the computation like yesterday, here it's easier because you simply have to, you, here you can, under, you can interchange always x and t. It's s and t, remember, there is a commutation formula which an extra error term. So we, if we do this computation, what we get, it's equal to lambda s minus k square in the s. If you are doing mean curvature flow or, mean, or curve, smooth curves, you don't have this guy. Possibly you already seen it in a whisker lecture that uh, the evolution of the measure associated to the moving hypersurface, in this case curve, is given by minus, for a hypersurface that is h square, mean curvature square, times the measure. In this case, a simple since uh, we have this uh, multiple junction around, there is also a contribution by the space derivative of lambda, of the tangential part. Okay, so if I use this, this must be equal to integral of our gamma i of lambda s minus k square in the s. So I keep this part here, minus k square. And then, here, if I look only at this, well, I have, a, a, I'm integrating a derivative of something. So actually, I can integrate the parts, or simply take the primitive. So this must be equal to the value of lambda at point one. Well, let's suppose that your curve is parameterized like this. This is gamma i one of t, and this is uh, gamma i of zero t. So what I get here is lambda in one t uh, plus lambda one t minus lambda zero Okay, as I told you, let me forget about, in all this computation, all the contribution coming from the boundary points where the network is, uh, is uh, fixed. So let me forget about this guy. This is only gamma i since uh, it's related to the curve uh, gamma i here. And uh, try to Uh, this is gamma i. This is gamma i of zero. Gamma i one t. This is our triple junction with 120 degrees. Because actually, well, I did it for this, but actually we are dealing with only triple junction, regular regular uh, networks. Okay, so this is the evolution of L i and I can do anything more than that. But now if I take the evolution of the length of the wall network, let's think to this special case of a triode, but generalized to any general regular network. Well, I have to sum all this. If I take time derivative of L, which is time derivative of the sum over all the curves of Li, well, I have the same conclusion here. I simply have to add all this contribution. So I have minus the sum of k squared on all the curve gamma i, uh, minus the sum on the all i of gamma i zero t. For the, for the all curves. In this case, they are free, but you can imagine it works for general network. 
Okay, this guy here, it's simply minus integral on your network, S of t of k square, like in mean curvature flow. And now, if we look at this guy here, in this special situation, there are only three curves. In general, there are several others. And, uh, but you can sum this guy in, uh, in groups of three. And if I add uh, this, the three rela related to this triple junction, and the same for all the other triple junctions, what I have, I have that I have, I'm adding the three values of lambda at this triple junction. But if you remember the computation I did yesterday, at every triple junction, when you add the free curvature or the free tangential component lambda, in the case of this flow here, you get zero. So you, for every triple junction, take the free contribution coming from the free curves, and that group gives you zero. And this holds for all the triple junctions. So all this contribution is simply zero. So this is uh, consequences of the 120 degrees condition. This is, in a way, one first uh, mm, hint that this triple junction satisfying 120 degrees condition are, in a way, inner point. Because at the end, the conclusion is that the area, the, the length, the evolution of the length is simply minus k square of S of t, like for a single closed curve. No contribution from the triple junction. Actually, here I'm forgetting the contribution from the boundary points, okay? But actually, it can be shown that since the boundary points are fixed, they are not moving. So if I look at what happens to gamma at the boundary points, it's fixed, it's constant, not moving at all. So if I take time derivative, I get zero. So at the boundary points, curvature must be zero. Tangential velocity must be zero. So actually, I'm not cheating too much in throwing away this guy here, because actually it's zero in this case. And this formula is exactly, it's exactly that, identical to the formula for a closed curve without triple junction at all. So this is the evolution of the area. Now the second, uh, which is the, the easiest geometric element that you can associate to your network, the second geometric element is the curvature. So now I want to compute, let me use I will do everything in the easy situation, but can be done for a general network, regular network. So you always have this. And now I want to compute uh, the evolution of uh, evolution, the evolution of an integral of the curvature. Because usually for curves, you estimate the, the curvature using the evolution equation that yesterday we wrote was kt is equal to kss plus k cube. And also there is, a, you remember the sign, the contribution by the, by the triple junction plus Yesterday we derived this, and actually, if you could try to use maximum principle here, because you put yourself in a maximum point of the curvature, so this guy is negative, this guy gives uh, some contribution, this guy must be zero because you're in a maximum point, so Ks must be zero. And uh, well, if you do it at the maximum of the curvature, you get Kt smaller than K3 by means of at the maximum point. And then you use this to estimate the evolution of the curvature. 
this if you can use maximum principle. But here, you must be sure that the maximum of your curvature stays inside of your curve, not on the triple junction. And no one can tell you that. So you cannot use this line for network, which instead is the main line for, <coughs> when, uh, for a closed curve, for instance. So what you can do, well, you can try with integral estimates. So you consider, for instance, with, with the idea that possibly there are cancellations, like before, and so you are able to conclude something. So we start considering this guy, the, the L2 norm of the curvature square on some curve on one of the free curves, gamma i. And again, we start taking derivative. We use, so this is only for curves. Then here, it's okay for us. So I take the derivative, here you have the S. So if you take this derivative, you have to take derivative of this guy, a derivative of the measure as before. So what you get is gamma i. Now I use this equation, so I get 2k times kt plus k cube plus lambda s uh, lambda ks. Plus the contribution by the evolving measure. I use uh, the, f I wrote it there, or you write it here. Time derivative of the S is equal to lambda S minus k square the S. So I have an extra contribution here given by k square lambda S minus, uh, minus k square. Okay, oh, sorry. Okay, yes, yes. okay, now I'm working on this expression. First, uh, I, um, I integrate by parts here, in the first term here. If I integrate by parts, uh, I get uh, minus two ks squared. plus two times k to the fourth power and minus uh, k to the fourth power. So it becomes, so I'm using this guy here, this guy here, and this guy here, and having this. Moreover, when I do this integration by parts, I have boundary terms. What is the boundary terms? Well, the boundary terms is given by two times. Again, I forget the contribution here and I only write the contribution at triple junction. So I get minus two times of k i k s i. Let me write like this at the triple junction. And now I have these two guys. And again, these two guys together are given by 2k k s lambda plus lambda s k squared. And you can see that this guy is exactly the s derivative of lambda k squared. So again, I can throw this, this term on the boundary. So what I take, what I get, I, I get is uh, uh, sorry, this one came with a plus, because as before, and this guy again comes uh, plus lambda k square to zero.
So I rewrite it here. like this, minus 2 ks square plus uh, k to the fourth power. Plus the boundary guy, which is given by k square lambda ks uh, k two times plus k square lambda. Okay. So now I would love to, I have a very nice term here, which is uh, this guy here. An Iger order, the Iger derivatives around is ks. And it appears here with a minus sign, so it's pushing things down. This guy here push things up, even if, uh, but, but at least it doesn't have an Iger order derivative. It's a zero derivative in the curvature. Instead here, I have this term here that unfortunately involve the Ks, the derivative of the curvature, point wise. So apparently there is no hope uh, well, I, I can guess that I can control this term here by means of this. In order, I, I want to get an estimate from above on this derivative in order to say that this quantity cannot go, you know, get too big too, far, too, too much. But, okay, I can imagine I can control this guy by this. But actually there is no way to control with an integral quantity something which is pointwise in the same, at the same level. But this guy cannot control point to ask a yes, there's no chance. Okay, now the point is that if you look at things like that, you are stopped, you cannot go on. But actually we are interested in the total integral of k squared. So actually, if I want to if now I look at this, the wall network of k squared in the S. This is equal to the time derivative of the sum on the, all the curves of this guy here. So the result is the sum on the, all the curves of this guy there, which means simply on the network. And as before, if I sum, I need to, to check the sum on the all curves getting to the triple junction of this step here. And again, or you think the simplified situation where there is only one triple junction, or you divide in group of three, of three curves joining a single triple junction. So suppose the we are in the easy case, and we only have three curves. We look at this, uh, at this guy here. In case we are easy situation, so we can say gamma one, gamma two, and gamma three. So I'm looking at this term, I, one, two, three, of two k i k s i plus lambda i k i square at the triple junction. Okay, yesterday, if you remember, when I differentiate 
the 120 condition, which means the sum of the tangent at the triple junction must be zero, I differentiate in time, I find out, if you get your note of yesterday, I find out that it must uh, hold that Ks i plus lambda i Ki times the normal and adding, you, you must get zero. was one of the conditions that I call a third order condition that comes out from the differentiating the Herring condition, one twenty degrees condition. Okay, actually again, if you do some linear algebra, there is only one possibility because this relation is satisfied with the free normal, which again, they sum, the free normals are rotation of the tangents, so they are free vectors, with the angles between them and 120 degrees. There's only one possibility that this, something like this holds by linear algebra, is that for the one, two, and three, these coefficients here in front of the normal must be all equal. This is true if and only if Ksi plus lambda k i i are equal to Ksj plus lambda j Kj for every i and j in one, two, three. So this quantity is the same as the triple junction for the free curves. Okay, how can we use this? Well, write it here again, that Ki, Ksi plus lambda, uh, sorry, Ks, I plus lambda I, Ki is equal to a constant independent of I. And in particular, since I know that the sum of Ki is zero, other conditional triple junction, and uh, these three are constant, this means that uh, the sum of 2C Ki is equal to zero. Zero is equal to this guy, but this guy is equal to sum of uh, Ksi plus lambda i Ki two times Ki, which actually is equal to sum of two times Ki Ksi plus Lambda, let me write like this, lambda i ki square plus lambda i ki, oops, lambda i ki square. And see our guy appear here. that guy there. And this equation equal to zero means that this guy here is equal to minus the sum. Minus, what is that? Lambda i ki squared because of the relations. Why this? Why this is interesting? Well, because the derivative of the curvature is gone. You have no more something that pointwise is at the same level of the derivative in the good term here. So all this uh, computation can be transformed in, uh, in 
all this minus the sum <coughs> over i of uh, lambda i ki square. And this guy is gone. So in this case, differently by the length, the contribution at triple junction is not gone. Before it was gone completely. In this case, at least it simplifies in the order of derivation. You can gain one order of derivation by using the, the, the relation at the triple junction. And this is good in order to do estimate because now there is hope that this L2 norm square of KS is able to control, since we are one dimensional, this guy here. And in fact, this can be done. And the tool to do this is actually interpolation inequality. I wrote here the theorem. Interpolation inequality of kind of Gagliardo Nirenberg inequality was developed by Gagliardo and Nirenberg, more or less independently. And uh, the theorem that I wrote there actually. Uh, you can find it on the book of Adams, actually. And uh, you have a curve with boundary, you find the length, you have a sensitivity function, then the first inequality tells you that you can find, you can bound an LP norm of an intermediate derivative in terms of L2 norm of a, of a uh, product of, uh, with powers of the L2 norm of the highest derivative and, and the L2 norm of the function u plus, plus an extra term which is related to the L2 norm of the, of the function divided by the length of the curve, which means that the, the more the curve is small, the worse is your inequality because the constant in front of the second term becomes larger. But actually, if the length is not going, is well separated by zero, that's, you can think of that as a universal constant. And moreover, there is also a L infinity expansion, so you have a pointwise L infinity estimate on intermediate derivatives in terms of the Iger derivative and L2 norm of Iger derivatives and the L2 norm of your function. I think you can guess that the function that I want to put inside here instead of u is k, the curvature. Because here I'm exactly in this situation, you have a good higher derivative terms with a good sign, negative sign, and there is something which I want to estimate in L4 norm here, and something pointwise. Okay, here there is lambda. But if you remember another relation that I wrote yesterday, <coughs> that uh, the big K is equal to the big lambda, where big K is the vector of the free curvatures and big lambda is the vector of free tangential velocity. Well, this means that actually that uh, the norm, the sum of the, the square root of the sum of the squares of the lambdas is equal to the square root of the sum of the square of the K, which means that if you control, that you have an inequality that uh, you can always control lambda I with some constant, uh, times uh, big K, which is simply K1 plus K2 square plus K3 square. So I can uh, always estimate this term here with some constant time the maximum of K to the third power because of this relation, of that relation there. This L infinity is 
on the whole network. And now what I want to do is uh, to use interpolation estimate in order to control this term here and this term here by means of this L2 norm here, using interpolation inequalities. Okay, I just uh, as you skip all the details. <coughs> But actually, two. And now I want to let me put this up. Well, for the first, if you choose, well, you is always k. For the first, you take n equal to 0, m equal to 1, and p equals to 4. What you get, actually, that uh, you get the k in L4 is bounded by a constant times ks L2 to 1 fourth k three fourth in L2 plus another constant divided by the length to one fourth divided times K L2. Okay, and now if you uh, take a fourth power, both sides, what you get is K to the fourth power is bounded by a constant integral of K squared to one half times integral of k squared to three half plus one over L integral of k squared square. Now you use Peter Paul inequality here, or Young inequality as prefer, in order to separate these two terms and to put a small constant in front of this term here square. So what you get here is smaller than one fourth integral of k square k s square plus a constant integral of k square cube, and here you get plus the, the same guy. Okay, this must be done on a single curve and then sum on. All, all, all the curve. If uh, you have a bound from below on your length, because these constants are bad when length is small. So if you assume that your length is bounded below by some epsilon, your constants are uniform, are there and bounded above by some uh, constant depending on epsilon. So now if you have this and you substitute this case for here, then we'll be bounded by something which is one fourth integral of Ks square plus a function of integral of K square to the cube to the square, then you can write plus constant K square square plus another constant, usual. And along the same line, using now the second inequality. The second inequality here. This uh, you can do by yourself, following the same line. And now the choice must be Again, u is equal to k, n is equal to 0, m is equal to 1, and p plus infinity. And uh, you get the right sigma that in this case is equal to 1 half. No, well, yes, 1 half. So you, again, have an inequality like this. You use 
young inequality in order to separate the multiplicative term here like, like you did before. And again, you find out that this term is again controlled by something like one-fourth integral of k squared s plus a constant k squared squared. But then you have this. We are, I didn't write it. So one is smaller than this. Second is smaller than this. And then you have this minus two times ks squared. But now one and two gives one half of this guy minus two of this guy. So all of these, one, two, and three, can be thrown away. Final conclusion, the time derivative of the integral of k squared on your is smaller than a constant depending only on the length of your curve, not going too close to zero, plus the times the integral of k squared to the Sorry, I, mm -hmm. sorry, here it's cube, not square, sorry. Cube here and cube here, also here. To the cube plus another constant. So what tells this that, uh, okay, this holds if during your flow, the length stays bounded away from zero. You have this with a constant uniform in time. This always holds. And uh, this for the zero lab. This already tells you, if you consider, you call f the expansion here, and you assume the length during your flow is uniformly bounded away from zero, then that you have an ODE a, well, a differential, uh, ordinary differential inequality for your f smaller than c f plus, let's say, d, with c and d uniform in time. Which means that uh, if at time zero f has some value, it cannot go to plus infinity as fast as you want. You have a bound in a small interval because you solve the the, the ODE with the equal and uh, make a comparison. And your F cannot, you have, if from a bound at time zero, you get a bound at positive time for a uniform interval. All related to the bound from below on the length. Okay, now it's already a little bit a mess, but. Uh, you don't want to do this only for the zero levels of the curvature. Well, you want to do it for the, all the derivative of the curvature. And uh, I'm not going to give you, to, to show you all the details, but actually only the final results. If you repeat all of this, including the tricks in order to lower the order of derivation at the triple junction, what can be done is that if you start now working on J space derivative of the curvature square, the line is the same, it's only more complicated. The algebra, the triple junction becomes more complicated and the inequalities also. Well, you get something a little bit uh, weaker which is the following, what you find out that you can estimate this guy by a constant times the integral between zero and t of the integral on s of t of k squared again to the power 2j plus 3, the s, the t, plus a constant integral over st of k squared 2j plus 1. 
only because it only works because the, the algebra that I use, the, the algebra tricks that I use on the triple junction only works when j is even. You can more or less do the same with the little weaker estimate. You see here you have this integral in time in front that is not present in the other estimates. But actually this is sufficient to say that suppose that the curvature is bounded, uniform in the flow, and all of this again under a bound from below on the length. So suppose the length is uniformly bounded from below. The curvature is uniformly bounded from above. If the curvature is uniformly bounded from above, all these guys are bounded. So the time derivative of L2 norm on, of every even derivative of the curvature is uniformly bounded during the flow, depending on the bound from below on the length and on the bound from below on the curvature. But now if we get back to the theorem that we were interested in, We want to show that something happens or the length goes to zero or the coverage goes to plus infinity. But now we, okay, let's try to work by contradiction. Suppose that uh, the length is not going to zero. Well, the length is not bounded away from zero. So support, the, the length is bounded away from zero and the curvature is bounded. So we are exactly in the hypothesis in which I did this estimate. So you have all these estimates. This and the other on the curve. So all the L2 norm of even derivatives of your curvature integrated on your network or on your network are uniformly bounded during the flow. But then using again the Gagliardo Nirenberg estimates, from L2 estimates you can pass to L infinity estimates. So you get by using the third ones. The, the, the last inequality. So then you have L infinity estimates on all the even derivatives. But well, if you have L infinity estimates on the even derivative, you also get L infinity estimates on the odd derivatives. This line can be done also for lambda. In that case, just for curiosity, you can do only on the first round for J odd derivatives. But then you do the same uh, argument and at the end what you find out that if uh, if uh, for every t in zero t, the length is bounded by some epsilon bounded by zero, and the curvature is bounded by some constant, then you have of k infinity and of uh, s of lambda infinity bounded by some constant for every natural order. Then, using the evolution equation, you can also bound time derivatives. Because if you have a time derivatives using this or the switching rules, you can always transform a time derivative in a space derivative. So controlling the space derivatives implies control on the time derivative and mix it also. Uh, and t fin. And now, if you control from the from the curvature on, you also can control of the derivative of your gamma. They pass to gamma. So instead of putting 
k in lambda, you have delta m s delta n of gamma infinity bounded by some constant. And finally, if you look at this, after I have all this control, well, already I can have, since everything is controlled, sending t to big T by Ascoli Arzela, I have a limit. I have a limit family of curves that gives you a smooth network where everything is smooth getting to the limit. But there is one condition that could, fo could fail, the fact that m the, the curve of my limit, I get all the curves converge to some limit. Well, this curve could be simply non-regular, which means that gay gamma T i x could be zero. I want regular curves. Okay, actually, this is also, you can also get this, because if you consider the time derivative of the logarithm of gamma x, when you do the computation, this is simply gamma x, gamma x x, divided by gamma x squared, which is actually equal to the tangent times the s derivative of lambda tau plus k in e. And actually now if you expand this and you have to multiply orthogonally for, with the tangent, what you get at the end is only lambda s minus k squared tau here again. The rest goes away. So this is equal to lambda s minus k squared, which uh, since all these guys are bounded, this is bounded. So you have that uh, this quantity here is also bounded on a finite time interval. So which means the logarithm of gamma x cannot, uh, that gamma, the modulus of gamma x cannot get close to zero and or too large, which means that uh, there is a uniform bound from below on modulus of gamma i x t, which means that we pass the limit, since uh, we are, by asking the law, we are passing smoothly to the limit. So we get a limit, so a smooth limit, we can use the, rest the starting theorem in order to restart and uh, contradicting the fact that t is the maximum time of smooth existence. Okay, these estimates are only one family of estimates. There are other couple of families of estimates that all are, are proved along these lines. For instance, you can, uh, you can try to do as an exercise, nothing more than the one that we did it uh, in details. You write down the time derivative of the integ of integral of k squared on your network plus the sum of the whole inverse of the length, which actually is exactly the quantity we don't want becomes too large. If L, if L for all the curves is bound away from zero, this guy is not too large. And uh, so, so this guy here you can, can be shown along the same computation. It is more than a constant of integral of k squared of the same guy and our li to the third power, similar to the other one. And again, if you call f, this guy here, you again find out even better these inequalities, which tells you that if at the starting point this quantity is small, before getting large, it needs some time. You cannot do it as soon as she wants. 
because you have a differential inequality, dif uh, an ordinary differential uh, inequality. And moreover, you can also make these estimates uh, invariant by rescalings, which are extremely important for what follows, because uh, actually what we want to do with all this set of estimates, we want to, we want to do a blow up, blow up and understanding what happens when you take the limit of blow up. So you want that your estimate helps you to take a limit. So the last five minutes, just to, so we have at this theorem here, so or the curvature is, un, is not bounded or the length must go to zero. And let's see a couple of examples that actually can be worked out with, uh, with details, that these are actually theorems. So if we consider a simple situations, a triad, for instance, what happens to the evolution of a triad if the free curves, the length of the free curves stay away from zero, they don't go to zero, then you have uh, that the flow is fully smooth for every time and possibly converge to the minimal connection between the free, po the free points on the boundary. For instance, well, this happens actually when the triangle connecting the, the constructed the free points on the boundary doesn't have any angle of more than 120 degrees. Otherwise, the minimal connection, and this guy is called a Steiner point of the triangle, is not existence. In fact, if you take a triangle with an angle larger than 120 degrees, the Steiner point is not inside. The minimal connection between the three points is given by the union of the two edges connecting, uh, arriving at the, uh, at the point where the angle is larger than 120. And actually, in practice, in this case, as there is no, the flow is smooth and converge to the minimal connection. In this case, the curve connecting the triple junction to the point where the angle is larger than 120 degrees actually goes to zero. And then you have to decide what to do with this guy here. But in practice, the flow stops there. For a spoon, what happens, you have two situations. Or, in this case, the closed curve shrink down to a point. Or, the, this curve here and in this case, the curvature is going to plus infinity. Instead, in this other case, this curve here shrink, uh, vanish, and there is a formation of uh, a double point on the boundary here. And it can be shown that in this case, the curvature stays bounded. In the, the guy without boundary point, the theta guy, again, other two situations, or one of the free curves, in this case, the central one shrink down to a point getting some limits like this, and in this case, the curvature remains bounded, or there is a, a full region shrinking down, and uh, actually in this case, the curvature goes to plus infinity. And uh, this is not uh, easy to show, maybe at the end I can tell you why. What cannot happen, so possibly one can expect that at some point the network has shrunk down at a single point on all at the time, this actually cannot happen in this situation for the theta guy. So in all this example, there is always a length going to zero. Sometimes the curvature is bounded, and the curvature is not, is not bounded. But uh, there are, in no of this example, the length is there, it's not going to zero, and the curvature is going to plus, to plus infinity or being unbounded. And this is exactly what I want to show tomorrow, that uh, in the two situations here, actually one is necessary. One always happens. And then you separate the cases in one plus two or one alone. And uh, the idea to do this, this is, a, I have to be sincere, it's a conjecture. <laughs> it's a conjecture because we are able to show this if this guy, <coughs> this conjecture, which is the main open problem, but in our opinion, main open problem, that uh, 
So the, the conclusion is true if you have this property that uh, if you take your network flow before the singularities, you sh choose whatever times you want to take the network at that time. You enlarge it or contract it as you well, enlarge it, enlarge, no, not contract it, <laughs> enlarge it as you want, and then take the limit of this guy, if you can. Uh, if you can take a limit, you get some limit, where well, what you get is never something with multiplicity larger than one. In a way, this means that suppose you enlarge your network at that some, in these guys which are converging, you have two lines with two, two curves that are getting closer and closer. And at the end, you t see a limit, which is apparently a single curve, but actually is a curve with multiplicity too. Because this kind of procedure, enlarging and taking limits, the blow-up procedure that possibly you already saw in a previous lecture, and it's, well, one possibility, but the main, the main line in order to understand what happens at a singular time. Why it's really important, this multiplicity and conjecture, because this is a good situation. If I know that my line with multiplicity two comes from a situation like this, it's not so bad. Because in a way, I separate the two sheets, uh, the, that are, uh, the two lines that are converging here, and I deal with the first and with the second. As graph, and I do a lot of uh, arguments and estimates on that. But if I only look, see this guy here, and I don't know from where it comes from, it can also come from, from two curves coming like this, shrinking, becoming thin and thin, that in the limit produce, again, a line with multiplicity two. So the multiplicity one conjecture that we hope and we believe it's true, prevent this kind of phenomenon. If you have multiplicity one, and you see a line in the limit, for instance, it comes from a single curve approaching there like a graph. If you see multiplicity two lines, it can't, it, you have no hint. If it comes from this, good, or it comes from this, which is bad. Because you see there is a lot of, co here there, you can imagine that these two lines are getting close to this with the slowing down the curvature because they want, they are getting straight, so the curvature must get done. In this situation, instead, these two curves are getting to the double lines, which has zero curvature, with a lot of curvature around, which is vanishing in the limit. And this is a situation that uh, you don't want to see, because in a way, there is no connection between the limit and what's happening a little bit before. Instead, here, the connection is clear. So this is why multiplicity one conjecture is very important in order to connect what you see in the limit to what happens immediately before at a singular time. And uh, tomorrow we will use this block technique in order to show that the first condition is necessary at a singular point and also the same block technique will be useful to understand in general the shape of the singularities at, uh, at a singular point in a situation, in more complicated situation. Okay, I can stop here today. <laughs>